I am now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jerry, for putting this uh, awesome uh, program together. And I'm based in uh, northern uh, Minnesota at the headwaters of the Mississippi. I'm in Bidawakanton, uh, Dakota, and Diné, Navajo. And uh, it's really good to be here with you all. Um, I'm also representing the, the Environmental Justice Climate Change Initiative. I'm one of the co uh, um, co coordinators of uh, EJCC. The whole production system is uh, very colonial from the, the view as an indigenous person, from the view from the shore. You know, we have the wealthiest nation here, but yet uh, it can't keep on the lights in New York City. <laughs> um, and, and one of the challenges we have in, in climate policy and energy policy is how do we democratize that? How do we bring that down to the grassroots? How do we get people involved? And that's kind of what I want to talk about. But woven in that is that we're dealing with energy junkies. I think we're dealing with the symptoms of addicts. Addicts that don't want to cut down their, their use of, of uh, their abuse and, and high use of energy. But we have to look at it from that perspective for those of you that come from a sociological background, psychological background, but we are dealing with addicts. We're addicted to the high consumption of energy and the waste, creating waste. And also in this issue, we have to look at this disparities between uh, the rich and the poor and how that manifests itself. Number one is that we have definitely, we all agree here, we have to stop cooking the planet. That's a terminology we developed in the EJCC. There's many debates on how we get there and how we get there. Definitely, uh, there's, there's a lot of good presentations and of, of different ways, different ideas of how we make that uh, establish, establish these targets. But we know that we have to reduce uh, CO2 emissions. We know we have to do that. But we, we have a debate on what is the targets we need to achieve. You know, our position with Indigenous uh, Environmental Network is that it has to be uh, ag extremely aggressive. It has to be very vigorous and has to have uh, mechanisms that where we can hold the government and the corporations uh, accountable. Most important in number two is protecting and empowering the vulnerable uh, individuals and communities that are out there. Um, so there is a social justice aspect to this because climate change affects us all, but also it disproportionately has impact in many of our communities on these front lines of struggle. Compromise, compromising our health, uh, with a lot of social economic disparities, cultural impacts, and financial burdens. Uh, tribes, definitely were, that's what I want to talk about in, in these 10 points as well, is uh, a lot of the climate issues impacts our treaty rights at the highest level of international law, our treaty rights. And uh, definitely woven in here is we're getting, we're getting contaminated from persistent organic pollutants, heavy metals, you name it, from uh, unsustainable mining, uh, extractive industries. Air pollution, already we know some of the statistics out there that, uh, that people of color are disproportionately impacted. Over 57% of whites, 65% of African Americans, and 80% of Latinos live in 433 counties with sub substandard air quality. In Native America, in our indigenous territories, if you go to North Dakota, Oklahoma, Arizona, New Mexico, and the North Slope region of Alaska, you're going to have high levels of respiratory illnesses. And in these areas, you will find a fossil fuel regime of uh, oil refineries, oil production, gas production, oil lines, uh, coal-fired power plants, uh, CD, CBM development, coal bed methane development. Um, right here is a shot in Prudhoe uh, Bay of flaring that goes on up there. And uh, there's a report that was done up in, uh, in, in, in northern Alaska that finds that, yes, there is definitely health and human health impacts of those uh, Inupiat people in the North Slope area as a result of, of this uh, fossil fuel production. And we, we've been organizing in Alaska through red oil formation of a network of uh, Alaska natives on the front lines. So you see here we were in Montreal at the UN meeting up there. We marched in the street. And this uh, man here, in fact, is from, uh, from uh, one of the Alaska villages that would be impacted from uh, if the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge ever got uh, passed. 
This road of destruction, the human rights impact to indigenous peoples, right in our backyard. Um, this is the tar sands for those of you that work working on that. It's very, you can see this on a Google search, Google map, and um, it's substantial, it's major. But woven into this are First Nations people, the Dene people, South Adair Cree people, Métis people, the crude oil that's coming down, there's a plan to bring that in and get it refined in North Dakota. They're already being impacted in North Dakota with the Hadatsa, Rikara, and Mandan people from, uh, again, air pollution issues, asthma issues around there because coal-fired power plants are surrounded by that. ExxonMobil, back to Navajo Nation, on my mom's side, uh, proud to be part of the Navajo Nation. This is oh a sign. God. <laughs> this is Anna, the small community. A lot of them still have the traditional housing we call Hogans. And there's a line that goes by, but it's not connected. Oil ponds. This is uh, Black Mesa. Permit number. How, how, does this look familiar to folks? Definitely. Mountaintop folks, they know this. A safe mine is a clean mine. Kofar power plants on the Navajo reservation is a big, big, big issue. And now, part of the, the plans again, part of this major Cheney Bush energy plan is to, you know, tap all the, all the fossil fuel you can get. So they're planning to construct another Kofar power plant uh, on the edge of the reservation in, in a place called Ship, near Shiprock, uh, New Mexico. And our people are starting to stand up on this issue and speak out that they're not only confronting the industry, we're confronting our own people. Our own people and the, and the companies know that and they keep us divided. So this is our own tribal Navajo police there, ready to draw his gun if he needs to. Direct action is, is definitely one of the strategies that we utilize in our network. It's very important to get the word out, to stand up and to defend our rights. And this is one of the, the blockade that many of you knew about, it's called Dota Desert Rock. That's the name of the facility, Dota in Navajo means no. Sarnia is uh, the, the indigenous First Nations, they have taken body burden testing and they are full of myricks, they're full of a lot of hydrocarbons, they are sick. And this is, they're just surrounded by Cancer Alley. This is the Cancer Alley of the Great Lakes. That's a big range. But people of color are two times more likely than whites to die in a heat wave. I wanted to give you an overview of some of the social justice aspects and how we're impacted by a lot of the uh, impacts of uh, global warming. Katrina is a good example of that. Um, one of the things that we have to do and, and as we look at these is bringing in the communities that are most impacted. With our tribes, we're looking at helping our tribes develop mitigation and adaptation plans to be ahead of the curve on addressing these issues. And we have to re require community participation, especially those people who are in the front line of struggle. We need to get those people here to these kind of meetings. And we have to level that playing field one thing I, I wanted to talk about real quickly was tribal sovereignty. We are not just mere stakeholders. We are not just the public. We have a government-to-government -government relationship in this country with the United States government. And that's part of our struggle uh, strategy. Oh, I don't know how that got there. Uh, <laughs> um, But we're using that as a strategy. If we can get our tribal consuls on the same page with what we are all talking about, they can utilize that sovereignty, that self-determination to put pressure on this government 90% by 2020. You know, we're stepping up on this. But the U.S. definitely has to take the lead. Um, we have to stop exploration of fossil fuels. We've got to shut that valve off. Our solutions in Indian country, in our indigenous territories, we have a bustle, our eagle bustle and our powwows. In the back, you see that wind turbine. We're looking, we're creating native wind. Um, native energy justice, it's something that uh, we have to do. You have to support that. Uh, 
The utility companies are very threatened by the potential of what we have to create. We've got to be able to tap into that federal grid. Um, a lot of things have been said on the whole uh, car, uh, cap and trade, but mainly ca uh, carbon trading. We are opposed to it as in our network. Um, and final, I'm closing here. Uh, we definitely have to incorporate the precautionary principle in U.S. climate policy. Many of you know what that is. Uh, in face of uncertainty, we just got to act cautiously. And we call this the seventh generation principle in many of our indigenous communities. We got to protect our future generation. That's